everyone, it's Jenny and welcome back to my channel. I'm here today to do my favourite books of 2018. But Jenny, it's halfway through 2019 already. Aren't you a bit late? Well thank you for pointing out, other Jenny, that it is quite a way through the next year, but I would like you to know that this is my channel. I make the rules and more to the point, I didn't start this channel until halfway through April. And I love a list. So I'm going to do this. She believed she could, so she persisted. Let's do this! So the first book is a classic. And that is Persuasion by Jane Austen. I read slash reread all of Jane Austen, uh, Austen, Austen's novels last year and it was glorious. And I hadn't read this one before, I knew nothing about it, but it is my second favourite now, I think, after Pride and Prejudice. Such a joy. A joy, I tell you. This is about Anne Elliot, who was engaged to Captain Wentworth, that handsome, dashing Captain Wentworth but under the pressure of her family decided to forego the engagement and eight years have passed and he comes back into her social circle and he seems to be completely disinterested in her and actually more interested in her friend Louisa. So it's a lot about love and not necessarily unrequited love but more about how that endures time and it's just such a joy but also a really good example of how important it was to a woman for, to marry. She has a friend, I cannot for the life remember her name, but she's in impoverished circumstances and it's a lot about how difficult it was for women to provide for themselves in this time period in the early 19th century. And I just loved it. I really enjoyed all of the novel that was set in Bath, which is most of it, I would say, especially because I've been there recently. So it's wonderful. And also some of her brothers were in the Navy, so I can see how Captain Wentworth being in the Navy must be really close to her heart as a, as a character and, and a story and plotline. Oh, I just loved this so much. And it, actually, at first, I wasn't sure. I didn't think I was going to love it as much as I did. By the end, I was so engrossed and I cared about Anne so much. It, it's just wonderful. Yes. Un it's underrated, I think. Out of all of Boston's novels, it is underrated. Then I have the first Persephone classic I ever read, and that is... Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day by Winifred Watson and this is part of um, Persephone Books' publishing house which focuses on 20th century women writers who are out of print or just not very widely known and it's a wonderful initiative for a publishing house to have I think so I'm obviously fully on board with it and I wrote this just after I finished my dissertation and I've done my masters and it was exactly what I needed. It goes through just over 24 hours of a woman who is in need of work and goes to an agency and ends up being sent to a woman who is in a lot of hot water with her various different love lives and men that she is seeing to try and benefit her acting career or her general how is it seeing career oh my gosh this is a while since i've read this but i, lo I loved it it is so fun and while it seems you know quite light as a book in terms of its subject matter it is just so whimsical and kind of I suppose Cinderella-esque in places. It's not that it is you know like a fairy tale in that way but I just thought it was the best book to read on a rainy day and I completely fell in love with it and I can't fault it. I just can't fault it in any way. It was just one of the most enjoyable reads I had all year. I think partly because it was like freedom i finished studying i have three months off before i start my phd let's read something fun and this was exactly what i needed so that definitely enhanced the reading experience for me but if you're ever sad just read this because miss patrick grew is just so clear-headed and deals with every situation that they throw at her so wonderfully and the outcomes are hilarious and clever and it's just a whirlwind of a day and I have to say I watched the film first years before I read this and this is so much better than the film I, I completely loved the characters so much more and they're better to better I think than in the film maybe that's just a bit but anyway I loved this yay then I have some serious non-fiction now it's very serious and that is why I'm no longer talking to white people about race by Rennie Edo Lodge and this has had all of the hype very very deservedly and is probably the beginning of me being interested in books about this because I think like I said before that a lot of books about race focus on America and this is great to read a book about the British experience of being black or being being a person of colour in Britain and 
it was an education, especially about how bad our own education system is at telling us the atrocities that we committed so many countries, and not just colonialism, but just generally how political campaigns, even just a few decades ago, were racist. And I mean, look at UKIP, that, that's still apparent today. It is incredibly relevant. And I also really enjoyed the chapter about feminism and the idea of how important intersexuality is in that realm because a lot of women of colour or just people of colour generally don't feel included in that. And that, especially because feminism can become quite an academic discussion that it means that if you don't have access to that kind of conversation or those resources or education then you're excluded from that and inherently more women of colour are excluded from that because of economic circumstances compared to white women so that means that they're not part of that conversation and they're not included and they're not listened to and I think that was, that was just the most important thing about this book is just realising we need to listen to people more who have these experiences because we don't understand, like I cannot understand what that is like to feel excluded in that way and it's just a really, a really well argued discussion about race and, and all the different aspects of life that affects and the origins of it because Wow, I, I learned a lot, guys, from this book. And but it also doesn't feel preachy. It doesn't it doesn't feel like I hate every white person and you are all a terrible <laughs> collective. It it's not like that at all, so like don't feel discouraged but by the title or anything, but it's a real eye opener. Yes, please read this. Please read this. Then I have a book that won the woman's prize, and that is Home Fire by Camille Shams. It's signed. I met her. Wait, let me show you. Wait, wait. Can you see? This is a kind of modern retelling of Antigone, but I still have Antigone, so I couldn't tell you how well that translates. But this is about three siblings, Isma, Anika and Parvez, and I think Anika and Parvez are twins. And it's about partly the, the overhanging legacy of their father who was a jihadist and how that affects them in terms of the government surveying them and things, even like their Google searches. I had no idea how much the government can control and has suspicions of people just because they're Muslim sometimes um, but also about how Parvez becomes radicalised and sees himself ha as having a duty to fulfil some kind of tribute to his jihadist father and I think what this book does so well is without any kind of judgement it writes both about radicalisation but also about the government's mistreatment of Muslim Britain rich people and it's just such a wonderfully spun and well written tale of a family or of, of siblings and the pain of what happens when your loyalty is tested and, and how do you reconcile the fact that your brother has become radicalised but when you still love him you still have a relationship with him or, or at least you still want to have a relationship with him and I thought it was such a complex wonderful narrative that had a very memorable ending. Everyone talks about that about how they kept at the ending and I completely agree with that and it does make me want to read Antigone because I think I'd like to see how that ends to see the correlation there I'm sure there is somewhere but it, it's just completely deserving of all the praise I, I thought two of the novels by her so I hope that they're just as good then I have the first of the two memoirs on my list and that is Educated by Tara Westover this again very hyped it is about a woman who grew up in a very extreme Mormon I don't want to say cult like it kind of is cultish though family out in Utah, rural Utah. Is it Utah? Am I making it up? I presume it's Utah. America's a big place, don't quote me on that. But it is about her growing up and really escaping that life because she didn't even go to school when she was a child and miraculously, you know, ended up getting a PhD at Cambridge so it's a real rise to riches story essentially and considering how many horrific accidents happen to her family in this book it is a, mi a literally a miracle that they're alive some of them it's it's pretty horrific if you don't like that serious trigger warnings for that and, and just generally there's quite a lot of domestic abuse in this I would say and it is incredibly inspiring because she ends up going to Cambridge to get a PhD which is not a spoiler because you know just sit on the back but it's a wonderful story of overcoming but also it's quite human and painful about the difficulties of 
going away from your family and when you change not not just a simple opinion but you change your whole way of life and how hard that is to know that your family will not be able to accept that but knowing that you cannot return to the person that you once were because that's damaging obviously I mean go to the hospital if you're burnt for goodness sake <laughs> but I was really addicted to reading this I couldn't put it down I wanted more I was so invested in her life especially because she's real she's a person guys she's done so much with her life I felt strangely proud of her at the end I don't even know why when she said about getting her PhD I was just like wow I, you go Tara you go <laughs> I don't even know her but I loved this then I have another book that was shortlisted for the Women's Prize last year and that is when I Hit You by Mina Kandasmi. I read this after the winner was announced. I have to admit, when the winner was announced, I hope I was the only one that I read, so I was thrilled about it. But I think this is actually my favourite. Not I've read the whole shortlist, but this is a partially biographical story of a woman in India who is abused and raped by her husband. What this book is incredibly successful in doing is helping someone who, from an outsider perspective, could never understand that how any woman or man could put up with that kind of abuse and treatment in a marriage. And it just shows how small chipping away at her rights and her life goals and expectations can grind you down to the point where she has no one to support her, she's completely isolated from communicating with anyone, from being on social media, from emailing people, from phoning people, from writing, from being creative, being, being herself. All she's expected to be is a dutiful wife and even her mother is telling her that she needs to make her husband happy and that is the priority. So even her family aren't going to be any kind of refuge in the situation and it's about her trying to escape that. I love it because it's I say it's very often, but it's really beautifully written. Like it, it is very poetic, and I just thought it was so lyrical. I read this in one sitting, and I cried. I mean, serious trigger warnings for rape and abuse because that is genuinely hard to read. The way it's described is very visceral, and and it's you know successful portraying the trauma of it to the reader. But it's not the kind of thing you necessarily read in a train like I did because it it is such a heart wrenching narrative of a woman's reality that is sad because you know that women are going through this in some instances and it really humanizes it on an individual level and that's what i loved and it made you realize that it could happen to you and wow it, it was so powerful and so moving and i loved all the chess metaphors there, there was there were lots of metaphors and each section has a little poem at the beginning which i also really liked it's just a really well structured and well-paced novel and I really hope everyone reads this because it's just a wonderful example of how cultural expectations can be such a heavy burden on you as a woman especially in, in this case in marriage then I have another memoir which had a lot of press a few years ago and that is When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi this is I'm not going to say much about it because it's very well known a man well a doctor <laughs> Um, who found out he had terminal cancer and it's him writing about coming to terms with that and really about his last days I suppose and it's dedicated to his daughter which is incredibly sad because he never met her his wife was pregnant with her when he passed away and the thing is when I bought this book the bookseller said to me oh when you get about that far in you'll cry and I didn't and there's a message that he writes to his daughter towards the end, I do think it's a spoiler, and I was very moved by it, but I still didn't cry. And I got to the end of his section and thought, am I a monster? Because this didn't make me cry. But then there's an afterword written by his wife that talks about him dying, and dear lord did I sob. I have never cried at a book so much. And the funny thing is, I don't cry very often at books, but I realised like recently books have made me cry a lot more. I don't know if that's because I'm just an emotional mess all the time now. <laughs> just, oh, all the feelings. Then I have another memoir. I didn't realise how many memoirs I have. These are never memoirs. And now apparently I read lots. But that is I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie O'Farrell, which seemed to really be doing the rounds last year on Booktube. And this is a very original look at a memoir, rather than just saying where they grew up and went to school, etc. It is 
17 Brushes with Death. And it's not just her, it's also her daughter's um, experience, near death experiences. I have to say, some of them are a little bit tenuous. And I thought, well, you might have been a bit injured, but you wouldn't have probably died from that possibility. Um, because I think, I think almost everyone's been almost hit by a car, probably. I, you know, lots of us have had experiences like that, but I've, I've never really thought about it as this near-death experience, so some of it was slightly overdramatic, I think. But it was really well written, I, it's the first thing read by her, and I really liked how each um, brush with death, if you want to call it that, is focused on a body part, and she had the, uh, well, she said beautiful anatomical drawings of that part. Like that. Wait, can you see? Sorry, the light's not good. I just think they're really beautiful and my camera just died, so if the angle is slightly different, that is why. But where was I? What was I even talking about? This one. Yes, I enjoyed it. I just really like the concept of this because there's, there's something about talking about those near-death experiences when you're at your most vulnerable and also talking about your body in that way that made it really intimate to read compared to just giving lots of details generally about your life that anyone could google probably or you could just talk about in an interview so I thought this was really clever I really liked how this was written some of it was quite suspenseful as well especially there's a part with her daughter and I'm like wow I didn't know what was going to happen there it was a wild ride <laughs> that chapter but I definitely want to read some of her fiction now because this was so well written I'm, I'm sold on Maggie Farrell then we have a Victorian classic how predictable to it surprisingly actually the only one. I could have put David Copper on this list, but I was trying to be really, really strict. So I'm just picking this one. And that is North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, which was kind of predictable that I would love. I would have read this, in, I think, in June when I should have been writing my dissertation, but I was just so distracted. I just kept reading this book. I mean, it's quite long, but it's the third of her novels that I've read. Is it the third? This is the third. This book has been described as Pride and Prejudice with Mills, and I think that's pretty accurate. It's about Margaret Hale, who has to leave her comfortable southern life in Helston to move up north to, I think it's called, is it Milton Northern, I think the town's called? The, this fictional industrial town, which is basically Manchester, because Gaskell lived there for a long time. And it's about her relationship, and, well, at first her opposition, and then developing relationship with John Thornton who is a mill owner and there are lots of fascinating conversations that ensue about master versus workers, about socialism and worker strikes during that period. It's just a very interesting social part of history in the Victorian period and I loved it so much but the characters were so wonderful and it had me exclaiming out loud. Obviously it also deals with the opposition and the friction between North and South and the pre-misconceptions that we have of each other, especially about manners and snobbery. It was really interesting because that's definitely still alive and kicking today. You know? I still haven't watched the BBC miniseries, which stars Richard Armitage as John Thornton, but I need to because that him being in it, honestly, that's enough reason for me. Oh, imagine. Richard Armitage as John Thornton. I also liked the look at the relationship between masters and workers and the mutual respect that's important, but also the human cost of industrialisation because the Victorian age is known as this incredibly productive age, which is on some hands wonderful, but there was a real human cost to that and the labour was intensive in some cases and I just think it, it's a really balanced view and there is just wonderful debates not just between Margaret and John but other characters as well about the effects of being overworked or just generally the expectations of a master to his workers and, and but also the pressures of a master to fulfil orders and to be prosperous and to keep in business it's it's just so complex and I loved it and it's wonderful it's one of my favourite Victorian novels ever I think and everyone if you like Victorian literature just needs to read this I don't know if it's my favourite Gaskell so far because I just love her so much but it's definitely up there for me and complete opposite end of the spectrum I had Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown which I read I think for Pride Month last year because this was in the Penguin Pride book club and again, it was just a book I read at the right time where I just needed this. It is about a girl, is it Molly? Molly, um, who grows up and it's it's really 
from her, like childhood to early adulthood that the novel spans even though it's, it's short it does cover a lot of her life and it's wonderful just because she's the most fantastic bisexual character I have ever read about and I loved it because it's just a matter of fact that if you're gay you're gay and if you if you want to sleep with girls sleep with girls if you want to sleep with guys sleep with guys like just just do what you want it's so brilliantly feminist and genuinely groundbreaking considering this was written in the 70s i was amazed i'm published not just written and then came out 30 years later this this was published in the 70s isn't that amazing and she's just such a wonderful character especially because i think it's really realistic because yes she is determined she's ambitious she wants to take over all of this patriarchal bullshit but in her ambitions to become a filmmaker she has to hit and overcome the very real brick wall that she is a female director and people don't really care what female directors have to say a lot of the time and I liked that because sometimes these books are great but they don't have a realistic ending and it's nice to have a fairy tale sometimes but this was just much more relatable I think because you see a woman who has a dream but she's struggling to achieve it even though she's brilliant and even though she's trying as hard as she can and I thought that was just much more rewarding to read about in some ways than someone who just gets it all because she is fantastic <laughs> you know because every woman struggles even if you're sure of yourself even if you're not ashamed of your sexuality but sometimes it's just hard to do what you want to do and that is because you're a woman sometimes and I just really valued reading this as an experience it's definitely a book I'll reread I think it could now be it probably is one of my favorite books of all time I'm, I recommend it to some friends and it's just it's just wonderful <laughs> just everyone should read this everyone then I have the only translated novel on my list and that is the Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante and I heard about this um, from Lauren's channel at Recent Daydreams and it just sounded right up my alley. This is about Olga when she finds out that her husband is having an affair and how she deals with that or, or in, in some ways doesn't deal with that very well and the expectation of women to keep it together in situations to look after children to be a dutiful wife or a dutiful mother and to keep herself presentable and it's really about herself mentally falling apart and piecing herself back together again and the loss of that relationship and what that does to her that she has to hurt first before she can heal before she can reconnect with other people emotionally and just build new relationships and it's just really moving and I think some people wouldn't like this some people would probably read this and think she's a bit self-centered or she's a bit selfish but it was just refreshing to read about a woman who had zero fucks to give and just was living her life as best she could and struggling through and just taking each day as it comes and I was so engrossed in this character and so angry at her husband it's unbelievable and it just really even though I'm not married I don't have children it just struck a chord with me about the expectations of what happens when that relationship that has been so central to your life breaks down especially because I think people often talk with divorce about oh it's worse on the, on the children but actually it's saying no look look how hard it is for a mother when you have to keep the family together and you have to keep the kids fed and you know to keep your kids alive essentially and how hard is that when that is your responsibility still but you are not dealing with life very well and you're not dealing with your emotions very well and it was sorry I'm rambling now but I just love this okay <laughs> I just love this exploration of a topic that I think doesn't get enough time a lot so yes read it please I haven't read anything else by her now but I'm almost scared too because this was so perfect to me I don't think anything can ever top this now so we'll see but I definitely want to read more by Italian authors so if you know of any other Italian authors that were translated into English please let me know because this was a dream of a book. Then I have a graphic novel and that is The Complete Mouse by Art Spiegelman. This is probably one of the most fam famous even graphic novels ever. It's a real stalwart of the genre and rightly so. It is again a book that made me cry <laughs> um i will say I, because this is about the holocaust it's about him interviewing his father about surviving the holocaust 
but also it's about his relationship with his father and how complicated that is and how difficult they find it to communicate and how they become close through him talking about his experiences and because it's about the Holocaust I have really weird and like terrifying dreams when I read this before I went to bed so don't do that read something happy cleanse your mind before you go to bed because this is yeah it's 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 pretty grim what is clever about this graphic novel though is how he makes it somehow easier to stomach through the use of animal imagery so the nazis are cats the jews are mice the poles are pigs and i think the americans are dogs and somehow with it being drawn as animals it makes it okay or not okay but it makes it less harrowing i think because it is slightly less realistic I mean, let me show you what I mean. I don't know how well you can see this. Eh. Can you see? I don't know. But it's just really imaginative and a fresh perspective on a Holocaust survivor story in that way, but it's just incredibly personal as well and it's really intimate because it's such a, well, yeah, an in-depth look at his relationship with his father and his father's reaction to everything that he's talking about and him talking about his mother and just just the ending oh the ending i don't want to spoil it but it made me cry wow i was so moved i it's possibly one of the most moving endings i have ever read and it's one of those books that i think really shows the potential of graphic novels because this just would not have been as good if it was written in a traditional prose format like a novel this is definitely a million times more powerful through the use of the media of his drawings and it rightly so has had a lot of awards and praise and I just if you haven't got into graphic novels but you're interested in them or if you're interested in history and you don't mind something that's a bit grim like the Holocaust then this is an amazing place to start because it's definitely one of the best graphic novels I've ever if not probably is the best graphic novel I've ever read I am so so glad I read this and if you if you like graphic novels but you haven't read this then you absolutely need to get to it because it's special it's so special anybody else stop talking about it now and then last but not least we made it guys it is the restless girls by jesse burton this was a complete joy i'm ending on a happy note you'll be pleased to know i didn't want to end on a sad holocaust graphic novel and it is a feminist retelling of my favourite fairy tale which is The Child Dancing Princesses and I love it because it's a really underrated fairy tale guys I think it's a Grimm's fairy tale and it was the book when I was a kid me and my sister would get out of the library over and over again to look at the beautiful illustrations so this also has beautiful illustrations let me see if I can find some for you and it's wonderful because it's the, it's the story of princesses who have a secret door and every night they escape can you see that isn't it beautiful they escape down a passageway to go dancing every night and the king is confused why their shoes are constantly worn out and tries to see if he can find a man that can solve the mystery and if he does he can choose one of his daughters to get married so it's about the girls outsmarting the king and all the suitors as well and it's really it's it's funny but it's also just just a great book like not just for girls but I just love the fairy telling of it because fairy tales let's be honest the original ones are quite problematic a lot of them are very religious so sometimes people get sacrificed for the sake of like proving a moral um and it's a bit macabre as well a, lo a lot of the original fairy tales so this was just beautiful and just a really fun update and Jessie Burton of course wrote The Miniaturist which I have read now and I loved that as well but it was really cool to see her write for children for a younger age group and I, look I'm not sure but I loved this this was one of the best things <laughs> that I bought all year and if you like fairy tales or anything to do with feminist retellings then this is definitely one to look out for so there we go that is my very belated 2018 best books and I'm really happy I did that. I just, I know it's so late, but I made this list last year because I wanted to start the channel last year, but I just overthought it and didn't start it. And I just thought, well, fuck it, I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that was fine. I just wanted to track my reading and I want to look back on that 
in a few years time and remember what my favourite books were from that year so now, now I can remember and if you've watched that thank you for sticking with me because I know I'm always like I'll keep this short guys and then half an hour later I'm still rambling about how wonderful books are so thank you for watching I hope you have a great reading day week year whatever and I will see you soon for Bookish Shenanigans bye